Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie. I'm on behalf of Book Soup. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a virtual event this evening with Jamie Kirchick discussing Secret City, the hidden history of Gabe Washington. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring our authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads Secret City below the viewer screen. The link will redirect, redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. If you'd like to ask a question during the event, please use the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen and type it in. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. So tonight we have Jamie Kirchick, who will be discussing Secret City, the hidden history of Gay Washington. He's written about human rights, politics, and culture from around the world, a columnist for Tablet Magazine, a writer at large for Airmail, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He is the author of The End of Europe, Dictators, Demagogues, and The Coming of the Dark Age, and The Coming Dark Age. Uh, his work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, the New York Review of Books, and the Times Literary Supplement, if you've ever heard of any of those. Um, a graduate of Yale with degrees in history and political science, uh, science, 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 ugh, that's double entendre. He resides in Washington, DC. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Jamie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maggie, and thank you for everyone uh, tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a pretty big book in terms of page length and it covers a very long period of time stretching from FDR to Bill Clinton. So I can't possibly um, summarize it all. Uh, so I think what I'll do is maybe explain why I wrote the book and briefly touch on some of the themes and then take any questions you have. And uh, really any questions, again, this is such a huge period of time. Um, you're probably familiar with the book, maybe you've read an excerpt somewhere or heard me on a podcast interview. There's really so much to talk about. Um, every, you know, 11 presidential administrations, uh, the Cold War, the civil rights movement, the conservative movement, uh, and all the ways in which the secret story of homosexuality um, affected all of these phenomena, all these presidents, all these um, events. Um, so I think I was inspired to write this book sort of unknowingly when I was a student uh, at Yale. And uh, I was studying with a professor, John Lewis Gaddis, who is really the dean of Cold War historians. And I'm, I've always been very interested in the Cold War, really all aspects of it. That's really my sort of intellectual passion. Um, and he taught a big survey course on Cold War history, on, on basically the, the Cold War. He was the leading consultant for the, the CNN documentary series on the Cold War that, that aired in the late 90s or early 2000s, you might have watched. Um, and he was teaching a seminar, uh, and I took it my junior year, and it was on the art of biography. And Professor Gaddis was in the course of writing the biography of George Kennan, uh, the great Cold War strategist who devised the containment strategy. Uh, and for this class, every week we had to read a biography of anyone alive or dead whose papers were held at Yale. And it just so happened that that spring, uh, Larry Kramer uh, had donated, was in the process of, or had just donated his papers to Yale. And Larry Kramer, if you haven't heard of him, you should. He was uh, a very well-known um, gay writer, playwright, novelist. Uh, and then in the 1980s, he became really one of the most vocal and the, really the most vocal AIDS activist. He founded the organization Gay Men's Health Crisis in his uh, living room in his Greenwich Village apartment. Um, he was also a very argumentative person, to put it lightly, and he was eventually kicked out of that organization. He started an, another one called ACT UP, uh, which you certainly have heard of. It launched all sorts of uh, very public demonstrations. Um, and he had gone to Yale and he had a very tortured relationship with Yale. It's where he had um, uh, realized he was gay. He tried to commit suicide. This is in the 1950s. Um, but his relationship was getting better and with, with the university was, was, was getting better. And he, and he decided to donate his papers to Yale. And so I got to know Larry. Um, I, I chose him as my, as my biographical subject. I 
was one of the first people to go through his papers. I went down to New York and interviewed him and got to know him. Um, and he was very interested in gay history and he was really obsessed with uh, recovering the stories of gay people throughout history because he believed, um, rightly so, that there were, that, that gay people really hadn't gotten their due, uh, that they'd been erased from history um, because of the shame and the stigma attached to it and the bigotry and the prejudice uh, that they had been, that mainstream historians um, had overlooked them. Uh, had no interest in gay people and really how homosexuality uh, impacted history. And um, this is really what he wanted to do at Yale, actually. He got his brother uh, to endow a, a gay studies program to fund uh, research and to um, bring on professors who could teach courses in, in gay history. Uh, and so after I graduated Yale, I stayed in touch with Larry and he and I moved to Washington to work at the New Republic. And um, he was very insistent on this this gay history and studying it and examining it and exhuming it. And um, he wanted to know, you know, all about the, polit the gay political history of the city that I was living in in Washington. Um, and as I was living there, um, I also got to know a man named Frank Kameny another cantankerous Jewish homosexual, um, who in 1957, uh, he was fired from the federal government uh, for being gay. He was an astronomer, a PhD from Harvard in the Army Map Service, which is the forerunner to the Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And in December 1957, he was fired for being gay. And you have to understand, this is just two months after Sp the Soviets launched, launched uh, Sputnik into space. So the space race had officially started, um, but so obsessed was the federal government at the time with rooting out homosexuals that they would um, call back a PhD astronomer from Harvard who was working in Hawaii in, a, in an observation um, post, you know, studying the stars, mapping the skies for the U.S. Army. Uh, they would bring him back, call him back to Washington, and fire him because they had a police record that he was gay. He had been arrested in a public restroom sting, which has happened to many gay people in this period. Um, and I got to know Frank. He became a gay rights activist. He was really, really the first gay rights activist because he appealed his, his firing from the federal government. He was the first gay person to do this. Thousands had been fired before him in what was known as the Lavender Scare, which was the purge of gay people from the federal government that began in 1950. Uh, thousands had been fired. Uh, he was the first person to say, you know what, this is wrong. I'm not going to stand for this. Uh, and he didn't win it at first. He tried to get the Supreme Court to hear his case. They refused. He also interestingly tried to get the ACLU to help his legal defense, and they also refused, which I think is important to understand that not even the ACLU, which was founded during World in the right in the immediate aftermath of World War One to um, to defend, you know, anti-war and protesters and socialists uh, who were being imprisoned for expressing their uh, their constitutional rights to free speech, uh, they would not take on the case of a homosexual. That's how um, isolated gay people were in this period of time. And so he founded the Mattachine Society of Washington, which is really the first sustained gay rights organization in the United States. It had actually been founded in, in Los Angeles, in your town, in 1950. Um, but that chapter really didn't do much. Uh, it was mostly a social organization for largely gay men. It didn't really lobby or um, it wasn't really a, a public facing group. Kameny took the organization public. They, they waged um, letter writing campaigns. They had uh, picketing outside the White House and the State Department and the Civil Service Commission and other federal government agencies. Um, and Frank was in instrumental in the decision. Well, first of all, I should say he, he was the first openly gay person to run for Congress in 1971 in the District of Columbia. That was the year that the non-voting delegate seat was created in Congress, still non-voting. Uh, he ran for that. And two years later, he's instrumental in the campaign to convince the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its list of psychiatric mental disorders. And then two years after that, in 1975, he is uh, the main person responsible for getting the Civil Service Commission to lift its ban on gay people from working for the federal government, which had been implemented in 1953 
via executive order um, under under President Eisenhower. Uh, and so Frank, uh, I got to know him in, at, when I moved to Washington in 2007. I was working as a journalist at uh, the New Republic magazine. And in 2009, um, the Office of Personnel Management, which was the which is the successor organization to the Civil Service Commission, it's basically responsible for the entire federal workforce. They uh, apologized to Frank on behalf of the federal government. Um, and it was a very moving ceremony. Uh, the First Lady Michelle Obama was there. And it just so happened that the director of the Office of Personal Management was an openly gay man. So it was a very kind of poignant, fitting uh, tribute to Frank, who I think is really one of the great unsung heroes of American history. And I hope, I hope with this book, I, I can do my small part in uh, rectifying that. Uh, and I realized sitting in that room that um, this was an incredible arc, you know, just, just to see someone go from this very lonely position in 1957 uh, to now, you know, to taking on the entire federal government. And, and not just the federal government, let's keep in mind, the medical establishment, the media, organized religion, basically the entire, the entirety of, of, of American society was pitted against gay people. They were really the villain, the social villain. Um, one of the themes that I explore in the book is how pretty much every negative phenomena, or really every neg every external enemy of the United States is associated, not just external enemy, d d domestic enemy as well, is associated with gay people. Um, I have a chapter in the book about how in the 19, dur during World War II, uh, there was a widely held belief in the federal, in the federal government that the Nazis were a sort of gay cabal. Um, it's not just something that was, you know, mocked and parodied in the producers, the, the Mel Brooks movie and musicals. It was actually something that uh, high-ranking officials in the in the White House and in the OSS, which was the predecessor to the CIA, it's something that they believed. Just a couple years after that, you have McCarthy. Uh, McCarthyism uh, is associating gay people with communism. Um, if you've ever seen the 1991 movie JFK directed by Oliver Stone, which was nominated for five Academy Awards. That movie is based on the real life prosecution by New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison in 1967. He brought uh, a case against the only man to be prosecuted for the Kennedy assassination, who was a businessman named Clay Shaw, who was gay and uh, the district attorney basically alleged that there was a, he called it a homosexual thrill killing. That it was a right wing cabal of, of homosexuals who were upset with Kennedy for the Bay of Pigs for failing to overthrow Castro. And they organized uh, this, this, this right wing homosexual thrill killing to kill President Kennedy. And that's basically what JFK, that is the conspiracy theory that JFK advances. So you, throughout history, you, you see in the 20th century, you know, gay people are just being tarred and blamed um for these vast you know evils basically right fascism communism the kennedy assassination um and so you know seeing that trajectory in the life story of one man in frank Kennedy, someone i knew uh was very powerful and i thought that this was a story that needed to be told of gay people in the federal government the people you know unlike frank who was kicked out of the government and you know used that for for good what about all these other people who stayed in the government, right? Who, who stayed in the closet. Um, and then it kind of dawned on me, the more reading and researching I was doing, that there was really no, that in a, in a city where secrecy is a currency, right? If, if, if Hollywood, the currency is fame, that's what determines your status, right? Is celebrity. Uh, in New York, it's, um, you could say it's money, right? Wall Street. Um, in Washington, it's secrecy and access to secrets. Uh, that in this city, there was no greater secret, more, there was no more destructive, uh, more powerful secret than that of homosexuality. It was even worse than being a communist, actually. And I explain why, because a communist could uh, renounce communism. They could come out and become an ex-communist. And then, in fact, some of the some of the most influential and important leaders of the American conservative movement were ex-communists, including one uh, who I write about extensively in the book, Whitaker Chambers, who was not only an ex-communist, he was also uh, he had a gay life in the 1930s. 
um, around the same time that he was a communist. And he very famously came out in 1948, so to speak, and accuses Alger Hiss, a former State Department official, of being a communist spy. This is the first televised hearing, um, the first televised congressional hearing in American history. Um, he comes out very much as an ex-communist, and he writes an entire memoir about being a former communist, and he's embraced by the right. He cannot reveal the fact that he had been a homosexual. And the only reason we know is because he confessed it to the FBI, because he was afraid that the Hiss forces would use this against him to discredit him. And they they tried to. Um, they launched a whisper campaign against against Chambers because of this. But in the life of Chambers, you can see that you know you could one could renounce his communism and come out as a former communist, but one could not come out as a gay person. Once you did that, your entire credibility was shot, and there was no return for you. Uh, and so, you know, naturally, being a journalist and wanting to uh, uncover secrets and being interested in secrecy and secret worlds. Uh, this seemed like um, a fascinating and compelling way to explore the history of our nation's capital uh, at the federal level was through this uh, terrible, um, frightening, powerful secret. And um, I decided to start the book with the Roosevelt administration um, for two reasons. One is that during the New Deal, um, Washington transforms from being a kind of sleepy southern town um, to really becoming a, a city. Uh, it doubles, you know, between 1932 and 1941, 1942, basically the size of the city doubles. Um, and the story of gay people in America in the 20th century is really a story of urbanization. It's people leaving small towns, you know, the provinces, um, more kind of conservative uh, rural areas and moving to cities where they can live more anonymously. There are gay subcultures that are beginning to form in, in cities in the 1930s and early 1940s. So that's the first reason, but really the, the main reason to start with World War II, um, or the, with the Roosevelt administration is because of World War II. And, and World War II is when America um, becomes a global superpower and it needs to develop and build a bureaucracy for, um, managing secrets. Uh, it doesn't have a, um, an intelligence, a civilian intelligence apparatus before World War II. It develops one, the Office of Strategic Services during the Second World War. Uh, and this is when homosexuality goes from being just a sin or a mental disorder uh, and a crime. Uh, it becomes a national security threat. Uh, and I illustrate this transformation in the story of Sumner Wells, who was the undersecretary of state for FDR, and really the de facto secretary of state, because the actual secretary of state was a man named Cordell Hull. Um, he was aging, he was tubercular, he had wooden teeth, he, he would uh, fall asleep in meetings. Um, FDR didn't like him, he was a southern senator, he was from Tennessee. He only made him secretary of state because he had to kind of get to appease the southern wing of his democratic party part of his new deal coalition um so wells is really the de facto secretary of state and in 1940 um he is uh he, he gets drunk on the presidential train one night and he propositions a series of porters and this information gets into the hands of his enemies, namely Cordell Hall, but also another diplomat named uh, William Bullitt, who was the former, the first ambassador to the Soviet Union after the United States recognized the Soviet Union. Uh, and the two of them have it in for Wells. They don't like him. They're jealous. They want to get rid of him. And they try to use this homosexual smear to do so. Um, and it's interesting. And, you know, in 1940, they're trying to convince FDR to do something. And FDR actually defends Wells. Uh, when he's confronted with the evidence of uh, of what Wells had done, propositioning porters on the train, his initial reaction is, "Well, he wasn't doing on he wasn't doing it on government time, was he?" Um, so he's very loyal to Wells. He wants to defend him, and it's not until 1943, so so three years after this incident happens, that he's finally um, persuaded that he has to get Wells's resignation. Um, and the reason for this is really because of the war. It's because the accusation can be made uh, that Wells is susceptible to blackmail. 
um, that because he has, he harbors this terrible secret that he will uh, be liable, to, uh, he'll, he'll be vulnerable to the, to the blandishments of a foreign government. They will use this as leverage over him. And you, you start having senators on Capitol Hill, adversaries of FDR, try to um, threaten to launch investigations and whatnot. Um, and it's only then that that FDR demands Wells' resignation and gets it, he secures it. And this becomes the first um, use of, of, the, of sort of the gay smear to, to evict someone from a government job. And it certainly wouldn't be the last. And so that's basically um, where the book begins with the Wells story. And it, and it details for the next five decades what I call the specter of homosexuality on American politics. And I document its, its impact on everything from the rivalry between the CIA and the FBI, which in some ways I argue actually uh, originated with fights over homosexuality, namely FBI agents going after people in the CIA whom they accused of being gay in the early years of the Cold War. This was um, something that, that happened quite frequently. Um, through the era of McCarthyism, and I mentioned the Lavender Scare, which is which was a corollary, random parallel to the much better known Red Scare that we're all familiar with. Well, there was a Lavender Scare too, and just as many, if not more, gay people or people who were just accused of being gay lost their jobs and suffered because of it. Uh, I take it through Camelot and the Kennedy years, um, through LBJ, and uh, a story I tell of a very close aide who worked for him, uh, who had to, uh, who was fired because he was gay. Uh, and the story's never been told before. I, I tell it through his um, FBI file, which I had declassified. Um, I take it through the Nixon years and we really see uh, how Nixon's paranoid mind uh, also lent itself very easily to kind of the conspiratorial homophobia um, that is um, present throughout American history, but he, Nixon is really obsessed with homosexuality in a way that no one else is. He believes that, you know, leaks from the White House um, or from the administration, he instantaneously believes that they are due to, you know, homosexuals being responsible for them. Uh, and we, we hear on the Nixon tapes, the White House tapes, uh, these long conversations with his aides where he's talking at length about homosexuality and how it's responsible for the downfall of ancient civilizations and how the Soviets are trying to spread it in America because it will you know, weaken the fiber of, of American society. Um, and then I take it through probably the biggest chunk of the book is really the Reagan years um, uh, for several reasons that I find fascinating. One is what I document or what I call the sort of aura of homosexuality that just surrounded the Reagans. Um, Reagan himself coming from Hollywood and um, real concerns that from his top aides that because he had this Hollywood background, he was an actor. There were a lot of gay people working in Hollywood and therefore there was this fear that he might be perceived as gay himself. Um, Nancy, of course, uh, just surrounded by gay men. Um, if you have a copy of the book, you can look at the photo insert. There's an entire page entitled uh, All the First Ladies Men, and it's just photographs of Nancy and her gay courtiers and friends and designers and hairdressers and whatnot. Um, and there's sort of a tragic paradox with this, obviously, because uh, of the Reagan policy or really lack of policy during the AIDS crisis. Um, and so I think I find that a fascinating kind of paradox or, or contrast um, was because the Reagan administration was actually full of gay people. Uh, there were lots of gay people in the Reagan administration, some of them very powerful and influential. And I write about them. Um, and they had to walk this very delicate line because uh, this was a presidency that, that really was supported and came to office thanks to the support of uh, Christian evangelical voters who had not been a, a, a force in American politics really until 1980, until his election. Uh, and so there's this, there's this tension between the sort of libertarian instincts of Reagan and many of the gay people who worked for him and supported him and this very homophobic anti-gay voting base. And then you throw in the AIDS crisis and it, um, 
uh, and it just becomes a very uh, tragic story of, of inaction. Uh, and then the book ends in 1995, and the reason I chose to end it there is because that's the year that President Clinton decided to lift the ban on gay people receiving security clearances um, that had also been instituted as part of that executive order that Dwight Eisenhower signed in 1953. It wasn't until 1995 that homosexuality was um, removed from the list of reasons that you could be prohibited from receiving a security clearance. And so that's really when the when the specter of homosexuality comes to an end. There's no more official legal um, bar to gay people serving in the federal government. Of course, that's not the end of you know gay history. Uh, the Clinton administration was also the administration that signed the Defense of Marriage Act. It's the same administration that signed uh, or that instituted um, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell regula regulation on gays in the military, which wouldn't be fully repealed until 2011. Um, and the closet doesn't go away in 1995. Uh, it still continues. But um, as I said, this is a, a long book. And I decided that it really is a book about the Cold War period, or really the World War, the World, World War II until the end of the Cold War, um, the era, the era when homosexuality was securitized, um, and that ends in 1995. And so that's that's when I decided to um, end the book. But obviously, there's a, it's a big span of of history. Um, there's a lot that I left out. I didn't even mention J. Edgar Hoover, so you can ask away about him if you like. Um, but I feel that that gives a pretty good summary of uh, the book, what it is, and why I wrote it. And I'm um, happy to discuss, take your questions. Question from Book Soup. Yes. What was it like... Um you know, you're a very young man. What was it like? Take, how long did it take to form out this book and to, to research it? Um, it seems like something that would take, you know, two decades, but I, you <laughs> haven't had two decades to do that. So. Well, I think I started working on the proposal. I, I, I mentioned that that um, ceremony I witnessed with Frank Kameny, where, he, where the federal government apologized to him. That happened in 2009. And I started sort of formulating the idea for the book around then. Okay. I started working on the proposal around then. Um, in 2010, I got a little sidetracked because I uh, took a job overseas and left the country and moved to Europe for a couple of years. And so I put it, I put this project aside. Uh, and then I returned and um, formally got the book contract in 2014 and started working on the book, but not full time. I wrote another book in the interim on you mentioned it the end of the end of uh, Europe that came out in 2017 and then I really began uh, this working I, I returned to the research in, in earnest in 2018 um, and uh, so now now here we are today I would say you know cumulatively I would say I probably spent five years okay. researching and researching and writing uh, this book so. It was, you know, but even I said, you know, it was it was gestating even earlier. It was it was gestating when I was in college as a junior in 2005. Um, yes. But yes, it took a very long time, and um, I was obsessed with the subject in a in a good way, which I think you can't write. Something I've learned is that you really shouldn't endeavor to write anything as work intensive as a book. Uh, unless you're really obsessed with the subject, especially a subject mm -hmm. like this, that's so massive in scope and that required um, so many, I had to read so many books. I mean, you just look in the bibliography, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's almost 15 pages of just, you know, the books that I'm, that I had to read, not, until, you know, not cover to cover, but consult. Um, I visited probably two dozen archives ranging from presidential libraries to just, you know, people who had personal paper collections that they shared with me. Um, uh, all sorts of Freedom of Information Act requests, and those take years to process. Um, oral histories, you know, uh, going through microform, old microform um, collections of, you know, the Advocate magazine, which was, you know, founded in Los Angeles, right? Going yeah. so in, in the late 1960s and going through all the old microform um, 
issues of these old magazines. So it took a long, long time. Um, but I was totally committed to it. And I knew this was a book that had to be written. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew it was just a very important subject uh, that had never been told before like this. There's very little written about any of this. Um, you know, there's one book on the Lavender Scare that came out almost 20 years ago. It's an academic volume. Um, but no one had attempted anything uh, as sort of epic as a book on the role of homosexuality in American high politics, in Washington yeah. high politics. Um, so I knew I had a really good juicy topic and um, it obsessed me. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night, you know, with my head, you know, ideas spinning in my head and have to write them down. Um, you know, I would use the notes app on my phone constantly, you know, just writing random sentences or random ideas I had. Um, and it was a challenge to write. I mean, writing narrative history, it's a different art. It's not something that I'd done before. And so I had to really kind of immerse myself in those sorts of the books that I wanted this to be like. And I, I would say if I had a model in this kind of historical writing, and I'm not trying to compare myself to him, I'm just saying this is who I, this, this is what I aspired this book to be like. It, it's Robert Caro's work, um, particularly his volumes on Lyndon Johnson. Okay. Um, and sort of uh, that, that sweep and, you know, telling individual human stories, you know, he'll introduce you to these characters, these people you'd never heard of before, but who had some impact uh, or Johnson had an impact on them, right? Um, and just the style of his writing, um, you know, sweeping, but also very kind of minute in detail. Um, that's what I was striving for. And, you know, as we all know, he's been at work on those books <laughs> for a very long time. That's why I asked uh, the question, because I was like, uh, other authors of similar yeah. ilk take, you know, take a very long time. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, we have two questions, actually. One in the Ask a Question box. Um, could you talk more about the gay men around Nancy Reagan, including Billy Haynes, uh, the interior decorator who was once Hollywood's top stars pre -talk, in the pre-talking school? Yes, Billy Haynes was the one of the top um, silent movie stars. And he was gay. He was a gay man. And he was told by the studio director, I believe I should know this, I think it was Goldwyn or Mayer, I think it was Goldwyn, Samuel Goldwyn basically, basically said to him, you know, it's your, it's your boyfriend or it's your movie career, right? So you either be gay or we're gonna set you up in a, they called him, you know, a, a marriage blanc, a white marriage, right? A kind of, uh, we'll find you a beard, okay? We'll find you a wife. Um, and Haynes said, forget it, I'm gonna stick with my partner. Um, Jimmy Shields was his name. And he goes on to become really the leading interior decorator of uh, Los Angeles and becomes a very close friend of Nancy Reagan. In fact, the victory party uh, after Reagan won the governorship was at their home, uh, Billy Haynes's home. Um, Nancy, according to this book about Billy Haynes, um, or it may have been another book, I'm not sure, but you know, apparently Nancy Reagan had previously been engaged to a gay man. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna look at the the photo page here and just you know go go through it and tell tell the stories of these of these people. But um, you know, at the top, it's it's Jerry Zipkin, right, who was the great Walker of New York society women. And this is a term and a concept that doesn't really exist anymore. But a Walker um, was a man usually gay, very discreet, um, uh, of certain means who would accompany, um, wealthy women, uh, who, uh, to social events, right? Because either their husbands weren't interested in going to these events or they were too busy at night. They would, they would find, uh, you know, kind of dapper, um, witty, uh, uh, homosexual man who could, you know, entertain them for the evening and be a great conversation partner. Uh, and that was Jerry Zipkin. And that's the kind of role he served um, for Nancy Reagan. And in this photograph, she's standing next to Jerry Zipkin and Ted Graber, who was another decorator friend of hers, who she hired quite controversially uh, to redecorate the White House. And this is right after the Carter years. You know, the Carters didn't really spend any of the 
redecorating budget. You know, Nancy went way over. She raised private money for it, but still it was seen as kind of gaudy, you know, very kind of West Coast, new, new, nouveau riche. And she brings in Ted Graeber. And interestingly, you know, uh, Ted Graeber and his partner were the first gay couple to stay overnight in the White House. It was in the Reagan White House. Um, and that was commented upon at the time. Um, below that photo is a photograph from a 1984 state White House state dinner with Rock Hudson. And if you actually look closely at this photograph, you can see behind Hudson's left ear a lesion, which was actually a Kaposi sarcoma lesion. And he didn't realize that he had AIDS until after this photo, which was taken on the receiving line. He didn't realize he had AIDS until this photo was mailed to him. And his assistant was looking at it and said, Rock, you got to get this checked out. And he goes to the doctor, gets a biopsy, and he finds out that he has AIDS. Uh, Rock Hudson, you know, the matinee idol, uh, you know, famous actor from the 50s and 60s. Um, he dies of AIDS the following year in 1985 and really puts a face to AIDS. He's the first public figure to die of the disease. And um, one of the finds in my book is, is I came across the draft of the public statement that the Reagans released um, upon Rock Hudson's uh, death. And I, you, you can see Reagan's personal hand, uh, his, his edits to this brief statement. And he really goes out of his way to sort of depersonalize his and Nancy's relationship to Rock Hudson. Um, if you have a copy of the book, it's on page 574, but it's reproduced there. And I mean, for instance, there's an entire sentence that's edited out. You know, he was our friend and we will miss him greatly. That's just crossed out. Um, there's a sentence, our memories also will also be of his humanity. That has changed. And Reagan writes, he will be remembered for his humanity, right? So he puts it into the passive voice. So, you know, for all the talk of like Reagan having Alzheimer, early onset Alzheimer's in his presidency, this was in 1985. And you can tell, I mean, he's really going out of his way to, to depersonalize this statement. Um, so even a, even a public statement about a celebrity who dies of AIDS, you can see the Reagans and Ronald Reagan in particular is trying to distance himself from this person in this, in this disease. And then at the bottom, uh, there's a photo of Nancy dancing with James Galanos, Jimmy Galanos, the famous fashion designer. She's with her hairdresser, Robin Weir, and then with Bob Gray, who um, is, a big, is a big character in this book. He was really the most powerful lobbyist in Washington um, in the 1980s. Um, he is the chairman of the inaugural committee in 1980. He designed, I mean, he plans this, you know, extravagant, fabulous um, inauguration uh, that is in real stark contrast to the one early, four years earlier that Jimmy Carter had. Um, this is a, you know, celebrity extravaganza and they fly everyone in from, you know, Frank Sinatra is there and all their Hollywood friends. And um, it's just, it's a big show. And um, Bob Gray was a was a you know closeted he was a closeted gay man. It was sort of the biggest open secret in Washington, but very close to the Reagans, very close um, to Nancy in particular. In fact, I interviewed the White House Social Secretary in the Reagan administration, and she told me that you know whenever the Reagan White House needed to know if someone in Washington was loyal or not, they would call Bob Gray because he was like the most. Um, he had, he had gotten his start politically in the Eisenhower administration. He went way back. He knew everyone in this town. Um, and Nancy really trusted him. So those are all the first ladies men. Yes, there is a great bio of Haynes uh, called Wisecracker. And I believe that may have been where, um, yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a, quite a bit in there about, about his relationship with the Reagans. I see a question. If the book ends in 1995, are you planning a part two? No. Um, <laughs> uh, just because I think I, I think it's too recent. I think I, I think so much has been written about um, the Bush years, you know, the outing in the Bush years that happened in Washington. There was a documentary made about that. Um, the fight over Don't Ask, Don't Tell, gays in the military. Um, I'm not sure I would have anything new to say about that um because i think what i well what made this book that i wrote worth writing is that because this was such a secret topic and people weren't really out of the closet until the 70s and 80s 
um, no one was really writing about this stuff in the way that it needed to be about, written about. You know, and so it 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 it's it's a period of history um, where so much was secret, and it required the subject required someone now going back and looking at it with fresh eyes, right? Looking at the Sumner Wells story with fresh eyes, looking at the Alger Hiss Whitaker Chambers case with the perspective that we now have, looking at McCarthyism, Roy Cohn and the Army McCarthy hearings, um, all this period of history. The people who were living it were not writing really openly about what it was like to be gay at the time. And so it required someone now to go back and do that work. Um, the gay history from 1995 onwards, we've had you know so many openly gay journalists, openly gay politicians, activists, um, pouring over this stuff, writing about it as it was happening. Um, I'm not really sure that it, that it merits the same kind of historical work that this period of time does. Um, so I, I, if someone else wants to write it, all power to them, it's not for me. Uh, given the backlash to a biracial man being president, Barack Obama, do you think a Pete Buttigieg or any gay person could be elected in this political climate? Um, I have said that I uh, expect to see an openly gay president in my lifetime. I think it's possible. Whether or not it'll happen, I don't know. I think it's possible. And I don't think they would have said that, frankly, before Pete Buttigieg ran for president. Um, his sexual orientation was not a hindrance to him. If anything, it was a benefit. I think it made him really, um, it made him, an, it made him a historical figure to be, you know, the first openly gay, um, serious openly gay candidate for a major presidential nomination. And to get as far as he did um, was, an, was, a, was an incredible moment in our, in our history. And having witnessed that, I, I, I do think it's possible. Look, if he had been the nominee, uh, I think there would have been a fair amount of homophobia, it's fair to say. I don't think, we didn't see that much homophobia because he was running in a Democratic primary. And so, you know, the Democratic candidates are not going to use those sorts of tactics against one of their own. If he had run against Trump, I think we probably would have seen quite a fair bit of homophobia. But I think if you look at the, 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 tra the trajectory of public attitudes on homosexuality, has been such a dramatic evolution evolution isn't even really the right word it's been such a it's been such a um a shift um a dramatic change and while there are moments of backlash and i think we're going through that a bit right now still the long-term tra trajectory is one of you know of of positive development right and so if, if you look at the younger generations of americans today um this is really not an issue for them at all uh, and so I would not be surprised if in my lifetime, and I'm 38 years old, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we see an openly gay person win, win the presidency. Uh, why did you not include anything about Jager Hoover? Well, I didn't say anything about Jager Hoover in my talk. I certainly write about him extensively in the book. Uh, he factors into that very first story I tell about Sumner Wells. He is the one... Um, who receives affidavits from the train porters in which they make these allegations, they, they recount the importunings of Wells. Um, and, you know, it's Hoover who's eventually, you know, pressuring FDR to get rid of him and Hoover who really reigns over the federal government apparatus that is responsible for uh, purging gay people from the government. So he looms large um, over this book um, you know, the question of whether or not he was gay himself is not one that I can answer. There's no evidence that he was. Uh, there's no evidence that he was anything. Um, he certainly had a very close, affectionate relationship with his deputy, Clyde Tolson. Um, and there were certainly rumors about him going back to his very early days leading the FBI. And I, and I write about this. I mean, in the popular press, there are intimations you know, of course, no one is openly alleging that he's a homosexual in the 1930s, but they write about him in certain ways, right? He has a certain mince in his step. Um, the New York Times, in, in one paragraph in a story, they say that he lives with his mother, he's a bachelor, and he collects antiques. And all three of these things are sort of clues, right? Um, and I document the extent to which the Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, went to you know, squash any rumor even private citizens telling a joke uh, or having a conversation. 
there are, there are, you know, you can read about this in FBI files. There are incidents where these private conversations somehow find their way into the ears of an FBI agent. Someone will tell someone who will tell someone who will tell an FBI agent. And those FBI agents will then track down the source of these rumors. Uh, they'll go to great extent and then intimidate. You know, there'll be a knock on the door and then there'll be, you know, two G-men with, with fedoras. Uh, and they'll be in, um, basically uh, demanding to know where this person heard that the that the director was a homosexual and why how dare could you be spreading these rumors um, about him? And they would intimidate citizens into um, into submission, basically. So clearly, you know, Hoover is a is a is a major part of the book, um, and he really illustrates one of the many paradoxes of gay Washington that the man who was probably most responsible for purging gay people from the government and ruining gay people's lives might very well have been a closeted gay person himself. Uh, let's see. Any insight on how these gay men felt hobnobbing with conservatives like the Reagans who had a hostile agenda towards the gay community? Did they feel any conflict? Were they conservative themselves? And I think that's, well, your last question is really the answer there. Uh, yes, I mean, these men that I write about uh, were very conservative. Um, uh, I write about one whose story I think is very interesting. His name was Terry Dolan. And he was really the most powerful, ruthless conservative activist in Washington in the 1980s. He was the co-founder of an organization called uh, NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. It was really one of the first political action committees. They could raise money independently to support or oppose candidates. Um, and he really pioneers the negative attack ad, which are so ubiquitous today, the kind of 15 and 30 second attack ad. Um, and he's accusing, uh, he's, he, he helps defeat um, uh, George, um, the 1972, uh, uh, George, George McGovern, uh, uh, unseats him from the Senate in 1980, calls him a baby killer. So that's the kind of rhetoric and the kind of tactics that he's using. Um, and he forms an alliance with Jerry Falwell and evangelical Christians. Um, and he's also a gay man. And, you know, he is able to somehow reconcile this to himself. I think, um, you have to understand where he's coming from politically. He's militantly anti-communist. He's into small government. Um, this is basically the you know conservative uh, agenda at that point in time. Um, I also think it's important to understand that you know homosexuality as a as, as a political issue doesn't really become a partisan issue really until the Reagan era, maybe a little bit before. Um, it doesn't really become a left-right issue until then. You know, prior to that, there were very few people, um, certainly in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. I mean, there's there's no one who could be considered pro-gay. Um, they're all supporting, you know, purging gay people from the government. There's no discussion of civil rights for gay people. You have Frank Kameny in the Mattachine Society, you know, protesting outside the White House. But there's no there's no one in, in American politics who is in any way embracing this cause. It's not really until the 70s when you have know, Bella Abzug, you know, the, the great liberal feminist congresswoman from New York, you know, she introduces the first um, gay rights bill in Congress. Um, but it's also important to remember that, you know, the parties were much more ideologically diverse in America, right? You had conservative Democrats, some of whom were quite socially conservative and anti-gay, and you had liberal Republicans, some of whom were quite socially liberal and re relatively more open and, and, and pro-gay, right? So this whole notion of, you know, gay rights being a kind of liberal left-wing democratic issue, that doesn't really happen until AIDS and Reagan and, and the 80s. And so, you know, someone like Terry Dolan, you know, he's justifying and saying, look, I'm a conservative. I am I'm right-wing. I'm, uh, I support Reagan. Uh, I support his policies and foreign policy. I support his, you know, small government approach and whatnot. Um, and then he dies of AIDS, right? So it's a very tragic, again, a paradox, right? A very tragic paradoxical story. Um, and I think for these men, and we're mostly, it's mostly men that we're talking about. Um, I think they were, 
you know, deciding to put certain concerns over other ones. They were privileging or prioritizing, uh, you know, economic issues, uh, foreign policy, hawkishness, whatever other issues that they considered more important to them. But AIDS changes this for changes this uh, calculus for for a lot of people. And there's another man I write about who's very similar to Terry Dolan. He's you know very conservative, right wing um, from Texas. His name is John Ford. Uh, he is a deputy assistant secretary of agriculture, uh, which he accepted that job because it was the highest job he could get without having to get a, without having to go through a security clearance interview. Because he knew that if that happened, he wouldn't be able to get the security clearance. He wouldn't be able to get a job. So deputy assistant secretary in the agriculture department didn't require that kind of background check. So he could get that job. He also um, he, he gets uh, he, he contracts AIDS. He eventually dies of it, but he leaves the administration. Um, and he becomes a critic of the administration um, in spite of being a very conservative Republican. So there's different trajectories for, for different for different people. And um, I try not to, uh, I, I didn't want this to be a polemical book. You know, I do make some points. I do have my own opinions and views on things, but I really just wanted to tell stories and you know, really humanize these people and try to put, I tried to put myself in their shoes or at least put myself in their context and their, in their times. Um, because I think that would, uh, make the book more honest and, uh, a better contribution to history. Wonderful. Is this uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Are there any more questions? Um, well, I, th I think that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to our guests and to everyone who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Please support our bookstore and our author and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Um, just click on the green purchase button that reads Secret C City directly below the viewer screen. Um, if you'd like regular updates on upcoming events, Please follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening. Thank you so much and stay safe, everyone.